Welcome you all to our Frontiers of Science uh, lecture this evening, uh, supported uh, jointly by the College of Mines and Earth Sciences and the College of Science for now just over a quarter century. Uh, my name is Frank Brown. I'm the Dean of the College of Mines and Earth Sciences. Dean White is away this evening uh, traveling. I thank you for coming, uh, despite the weather, which has been absolutely splendid today. Uh, with uh, Carlton, Carlton said that we had uh, two seasons in one day. Um, there will be one further lecture in the series this year uh, about greenhouse gases, and I hope that you've heard about the presentation in the uh, PowerPoint that was running earlier, and I hope that you're able to attend that. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from Dr. John Grotzinger, who is the Fletcher Jones Professor of Geology at the California Institute of Technology. He received his uh, BSc from Hobart College, not the one in Tasmania, but the one in the Finger Lakes region of New York. And from there, he went on to complete an MSc from the University of Montana and a PhD from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, commonly known as Virginia Tech. Uh, following that, he was postdoctoral fellow for a while at Lamont uh, Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. And his interests lie in the evolution of surface environments on Earth and Mars. He's brought field mapping experience to bear on topical studies of surface evolution that involve laboratory work in geochronology and geochemistry. Of special interest is the role of water in shaping surface features on the red planet. Uh, Dr. Grotzinger is a past project science uh, pr scientist for the Mars Science Laboratory mission, a member of the Mars Exploration Rover Science Team and the high-rise team as well. That's the high-resolution imaging science experiment uh, of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And that experiment produced high-resolution images so that the morphology of the surface could be studied much more comprehensively than ever before. Simultaneously, near-infrared images were taken to obtain information on the mineral groups present on the surface of Mars. With no further delay, please welcome Dr. John Grotzinger. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, share with you the ongoing progress that, that Curiosity is making. Uh, the rover was launched in 2012, uh, landed later on in 2012, and uh, is still operating to this day. It was a two-year mission, and we're coming up on the, the fourth anniversary here pretty quickly this summer. So. Uh, it's, I'm going to take you through this journey. Um, it's a really good one for people that are working in geology and geochemistry uh, on Earth. And Mars is getting to be the kind of planet where the, the, the more geology and geochemistry you take and try to understand how the Earth works, the more applicable it is really to understanding Mars. And so we're sort of turning the corner from what I like to call the, the Star Trek mode of investigation in planetary science, where you, you go out into the great unknown and, and find something that nobody saw before, and it's really cool. And, and Pluto, New Horizons mission, is a great example of that. And, and that's sort of inductive science. You, you, seek it, you, you seek to observe, and then you try to explain. But what's happening on Mars is that with the repeat missions being so close to uh, to Earth, we get one every two years, you can get more deductive, which is a more mature form of science. And what's really cool, I'm gonna end up by showing you what I really consider to be sort of the dawn of comparative planetary evolution, where we can look at very ancient rocks on Earth and compare them to very ancient rocks on Mars. And this is really an exciting new direction to go in, but it's one where you, you do need to pick up a fair bit of geology, geochemistry, and even geophysics. Okay, so I wanna, begin with a little bit of background. This sounds like I'm getting some feedback. Maybe we can turn it down a little bit somehow. Or I'll just lower it. How's that? A little bit better? Yeah, okay. Um, I think we're good. So uh, I, I think the best place to begin is by giving you the background context of the, the history of discovery over the last 
uh, five decades of, of looking at Mars. And it really begins with trying to look for evidence of water that flows on Mars, and then eventually the discovery of a stratigraphic record. Because once you find a stratigraphic record, you now have a time series of the evolution of, a pl of the planet, rather than just a snapshot of, of some dramatic event that happened a long, long time ago. So let's begin with that by, by first looking, and if there's a way to dim the lights a little bit, most of this is gonna be very visual. Do I do that? Okay. Uh, I'll keep going along here. Um, this takes us back, this top image uh, is a Mariner 9 image, which was a flyby of, of Mars back in the, uh, in the 60s. And what you can see here is a, is a branching dendritic network that to any fluvial geomorphologist looked like a fluid uh, was working its way across the surface of Mars. And, and so there was no debate that there was once a fluid, but what was being debated what was the composition of that fluid. Maybe it could be carbon dioxide or uh, you know, maybe even liquid nitrogen that could be cold enough to do something like that. So did it necessarily have to be water? So then we had the Viking mission come down uh, in the 70s, a decade later, and, and what we got was definitive confirmation that those features not only were still there, but you could see even uh, better uh, uh, examples of their, of their details. And, and with that came, at the same time, the orbiter observations and a building geologic understanding uh, of the atmosphere as well that, that led the community to think that it probably was water. But we still needed to, to, to land a mission at some point and determine that there that there was uh, water present at the, at the surface. So then you go forward, there was a nadir of, of two decades where NASA didn't really launch any missions because the Viking mission as an astrobiology mission swung for the fence. And it had a, a payload that was designed to look for life present today on the surface of Mars. And, and when the, the results came back negative, Congress just said, well, we're done with that. And so it took a long time for the community to regroup and come up with the notion that if you really do, do want to look for life in the solar system, you have to get more clever about where you go, and you probably need a mobile platform to go find the, the best places rather than just land somewhere, be stable, and, and hope for the best. Okay, so in the 1990s, we got back to Mars, and we had an orbiter, and this is an image that comes from Mars Global Surveyor, which is legendary uh, in the community of geologists that, that studies, whoa, uh, planetary geology. And, and what you can see here is a, is a delta. And this represents the missing mass that the previous images predicted. So the previous images indicate erosion of the planetary surface. Well, if you conserve mass, all that eroded material has got to go somewhere. And so eventually, where it wound up was in a place like this, where there's a delta that looks exactly like the kinds of deltas that we get on Earth. So now the plot is thickening because not only does this show that water was running, it also showed that there was probably a standing body of water because what a delta represents is where flow is moving by advection down a gradient, and then it hits a body of standing water, and the inertia of that body of standing water causes the flow to, to, to basically lose its momentum, therefore deposit its sediment, and voila, we get a delta. So the scientists that looked at this published this paper, and they were not so much excited about the evidence of the delta as they were about the implications for there once having been a lake there. And if there's a lake there, then that means you get a very different scenario for the ancient environment of Mars. Sorry, what are we trying to do here? Turn off the lights over here. <laughs> oh, sorry okay. about that. Like that, is that oh, better? I think that's good. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah, sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll do for that. Okay. okay, so then what happens is you now get this orbiter that goes around the planet so frequently that you can map the whole thing. And then here's a database where uh, the authors made the argument that anywhere that you see a yellow dot, you have evidence for incision and bedrock removal. And where you see the red lines, these are where the major, what are called outflow channels exist. 
So then a decade after that, uh, we had a group of people that was focusing on looking at layered deposits. And what you find is that basically all the channel terrains are at the mid-latitudes, and all of the layered deposits are also at the mid-latitudes. You don't really get some that are north and, and very far south. So it seems that there might be a, a climatic control over the distribution of these features. So the plot thickens a little bit more. The question is, what are these layered deposits? So you go all the way back to Viking again, which was the first mission to see something on the walls of Valles Marineris, and this is the largest canyon in the solar system. It's five miles deep from bottom to top, and at the top, there's a dark layer, and then beneath it, there's a light layer, and what you can see is streaks of dark material that are running down the sides of this gigantic <coughs> valley here, and, and it suggests that there was some type of banding, that would be the most descriptive way to put it, and a geologist would infer maybe there's depth, that it goes back into the hill slope there, but people were still arguing about that, that just because you see banding doesn't mean that there was layering, but nevertheless, uh, Occam's razor would tell you that there's probably evidence for layered materials here, but nine out of 10 geologists at the time would have said those are volcanic materials. You would have never have guessed sedimentary material. People suggested it, but it got no traction at all. So therefore, it was an enormous surprise to, to us that worked on the Opportunity rover mission back in 2004 when we actually landed in a place where nobody had seen any layers, but a crater punched through the floor of the, of the planes that we landed on, and we drove in, we actually landed uh, in one of these craters, but drove to a bigger one, and this is what we saw, is that there is a geologic record of Mars, and it is stratified, and with this comes the hope of someday recovering a time series of the evolution of its climate. And so this geology happens to be an ancient Aeolian unit overlain by an ancient inner dune unit. And I won't go into the details there other than to say that this proved once and for all that not only were there layers on Mars, but some of the layers at least were sedimentary. And in this particular case, these sedimentary layers were associated with the development of, of, of evaporating uh, water masses, mostly groundwater, that precipitated sulfate salts. At the same time that Opportunity was making these discoveries, the Europeans had a visible near-infrared spectrometer that was orbiting the planet and looking down, and based on the way that sunlight interacts with minerals, some of the sunlight is basically absorbed by the minerals, and then what you see reflected is minus what is absorbed, and based on the character of that, you can infer that there are certain types of minerals there. So where they went was to look at these great valleys, like the Valles Marineris, and they found one over here in what looked like a closed basin with a large outflow channel that ran from it. And in there, there was a mountain made of light-toned material that they then focused in on detail and, and made what, it, it, what I regard as, as the first map of stratigraphy at a regional scale for Mars based on compositional variations. So what they observed when they looked straight down was that the top of the hill was made of a mineral called gypsum, which is hydrated calcium sulfate. And then beneath it, where it's colored red here on the lower slopes of the hill, they had something that is called keyserite, which is also a hydrated mineral, but it's magnesium sulfate. And there's a boundary that you can see when you look at the texture of the mountain here. This is two kilometers high. And about halfway up the mountain is where you go into the gypsum, and this different texture that you see down here is where the keyserite is. So you have two separate data sets that suggest that mountain was made out of layers, and it was eroded to leave this mountain of layers by some weird process that maybe it involves the wind blowing. Nobody really ever is going to know how it works in particular at that location. But this is a powerful observation because now we begin to build a time scale for the history of the planet. And I think where we live today is somewhere around uh, the middle of the 19th century when geologists were beginning to make the first geologic maps on Earth. And so this is a book that if you haven't ever read it, it's a, it's a great read. And last year we did celebrate the bicentennial of William Smith's map. This map was first published 200 years ago last year. And, and in this map, we see a very simple representation of the geology of England 
with a bunch of colors that represent different layers of rock that Smith mapped. Uh, he didn't have orbiter satellites to, to work with. He drove around on, by horse and, and did all this mapping. It's an amazing task, actually. And if you draw a cross section, if you cut the Earth and then look at it from the side, this is what you see. And so you go from Wales and you go to the English Channel and you see all these layers. They're dipping. And the older layers are off here to the left and the younger layers are off here to the right. And basically what he was able to demonstrate was that each one of these layers had a different composition. And if you read the cover notes that go along with this, he actually describes how this map is the keys to the Industrial Revolution that he predicts for the British Empire. And of course, that's exactly what happened because some of these layers are coal, others are sandstones, Others are going to be, become steel someday. But I want to point out this, this green layer that you see right here. You can't read it. It says chalk. And chalk comes from the Greek word krita that means uh, chalk that leads to the word cretaceous. And so there is actually a part of the geologic time scale that we all use today that originally is related to a mineral. Most of these other names come from places. This is not a place, this is actually a mineral. And so what's interesting about that is if you take the different layers, and he was a surveyor, so he'd go from one canal to the other, and he noticed that even though the composition of the layers was changing, the fossil sequence would stay the same. And you come over here and you might have a sandstone with ammonites in it, and over here you've got a limestone with ammonites in it. So he, and most importantly, his nephew, John Phillips, realized that you could put all this together, and in England you could propose a time scale which was based on using fossils as the metric of time moving by, that basically had three units, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And that's fascinating because that's where we are today on Mars, as I'll show in a minute. So let me talk about what a time scale is for a minute because this is also important in setting the stage for why we went to Gale. Geologic time scale has two components to it. One is a relative ordering of events, and they can be almost anything that you choose. On Earth, we typically use fossils. Sometimes we use the isotopic composition of, of minerals that are in the rocks that we're interested. On Mars, what people are doing is using mineral absorption spectra that you see looking down from orbit and trying to link patterns together, trying to put things in order from relatively older to relatively younger. But then what you need is an absolute time scale on top of that, uh, something that decays uh, using the principle of radioactivity, and then we can get its age. So we, there are certain minerals that we love on Earth. We love zircon. This gives us beautiful ages on, based on uranium decaying to lead. And on Mars, uh, we're actually doing an experiment right now trying to date the age of gerasite, which is a mineral, it's a sulfate mineral that has potassium in it. So potassium de decays to argon, and we can measure both of those isotopes, uh, that isotopic system with the, uh, with the rover. So that's how you build a geologic time scale. This is what you get from Mars. If you go to the very oldest rocks, which are called Noachian, it turns out that if you look down from orbit, you see lots of terrain where there's clays. So clays, everybody knows what a clay mineral is, but it has water in its structure. And then after that, you go to this period of time called Hesperian, when the planet seems to have made sulfates. And then after that, we get to this period called Amazonian, and we have anhydrous iron oxides. Now, these names down here are the traditional names that all geologic maps that you see from Mars have associated with them. It's just like Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. But where these names come from is you look down on a patch of the terrain and you see the amount of craters that are there. It's just looks, it just looks like the surface of the moon. So if you have a lot of craters and you have a lot of big craters, that means it's an older terrain. And we know that because the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, collected rocks from the different terrains, the ones that had the most craters and the biggest craters, brought them back and dated them. Then the Apollo astronauts went to a terrain where there was almost no craters that was relatively younger, brought it back and dated it. And so we apply that to Mars. But the problem is Mars is not the moon. Mars has an atmosphere. It moves sediment around. It erodes stuff. It fills craters in. And so it modifies the record, and so we're a little bit cautious to use this 
literal export of, of the lunar time scale to Mars. That's why we're so excited that back in 2004, when Opportunity and the orbiting Omega instrument both started to find these sulfates, that as Omega kept mapping, it found that older rocks had clays, where all the craters, where the big craters were, you found clays, and where, where there were very few craters, the younger rocks are, you had this anhydrous iron oxide. What that means is that now we're starting to see emerging from the planet is a time scale that is not based on some exogenous property to the planet, which is the flux of cosmic debris that hits all the planets all the time, which has its own time constant. What we're actually seeing is the planet itself doing something in terms of its paleo-environmental history, which is indigenous to the planet. So by focusing on this, we're going to learn more about the environmental history of Mars. And it's not much different than, than going to the Grand Canyon. What you'd like to do is to find a place on the planet that's equivalent to the Grand Canyon that a rover can actually land in, so we're not going to go to the Valles Marineris right away. And, and you'd like to start down at the bottom and walk up through these layers. And as you go up through it, you go across the Great Unconformity. Here are the Cambrian sandstones. Up here are the Triassic Permian red beds. And everybody knows that all over the world, there's a lot of red rocks out there because the atmosphere did something. The climate changed in some way that made a lot of red beds. We can do the same thing for Mars. So this is some work that uh, I did in collaboration with a, a postdoc, Ralph Milliken, and some graduate students where we went all over to Mars and we said, where are the best intervals of strata and can we see from orbit their spectral attributes and try to build a geologic time scale? So don't try to read any of this, just pay attention to the colors. The names that you see up here are different places around Mars and this is like a bootstrapping exercise. If you're a biologist trying to build a genome, you want to pull all the pieces together and build a continuous record ultimately. So what happens is if you go to relatively older rocks, here's all the clays, and you see the layers here. Then you go to rocks of the Middle Age, and you get a lot of yellows and reds, and the yellows represent the sulfates. And then we get up into the reds and browns, especially up at the browns. That's where the anhydrous iron oxides are. And so we can not only look down and map and see the older terrains, we can also look in the cross sections in the stratigraphy and begin to see major patterns emerging. Uh, and I'll just throw one thing out for the geologists in the audience. It turns out when we did this, it wasn't quite as simple as it was supposed to be. But what else is new under the sun for building a geologic time scale? You take your first swipe at it. Somebody goes somewhere else in the world and finds something a little bit different, then you argue about it. So we happen to find a location at a different longitude where the planet never seems to have shut off the ability to make clay. And so these all look like relatively younger clays existing at a time when the rest of the planet's making sulfate. But the last thing I'll say about this is, this is why we picked Gale Crater. Gale Crater has the longest continuous section on Mars. We don't hope to study most of that section because when it gets up to here, we're not so much interested in the anhydrous history of Mars because we don't think that's when the planet was habitable. We want to focus on this part of the record down in here when we had the clays and the sulfates and iron oxides and other things, as you'll see in a minute. Okay, so let's get into Gale. That's the global reason we chose it. We think it's the best section to begin. Uh, here's a map of the topography, and as you go from whites uh, up to the hotter colors, you're going across 10 kilometers of elevation difference. So this is 10 kilometers higher than this is down here. So there's a gradient, a topographic gradient, and this goes across a big boundary that goes all the way around Mars called the dichotomy boundary. And what's dichotomous about the boundary is the topography. Even though there's a gradient, there's a jump across the scarp where you, as a step, go down into much lower elevations. And, uh, and Gale Crater seems to have hit right on top of that boundary, probably about 3.8 to 4 billion years ago is the best estimate of the age of the crater. Um, the curious thing, it's about the, it has about the diameter of the big island of Hawaii, and also like the big island of Hawaii, there's a mountain in the middle. And so when the discussion started about what this mountain was, it got quite animated. Because what's interesting about Gale, compared to every other large crater that you see around here, none of these have any mountains in the middle. And so this one is really an oddball. 
And yet, you know, geologists like that because usually when you find something anomalous, it, it turns out to be a, a, an interesting story. So th that's one of the important things about that. We're going to look at that in more detail. But <clears throat> one has to be able to pick out of initially uh, 60 or 70 different candidates what landing site to go to. And I heard all kinds of different arguments about why we should go here and why we should go there. And in the end, the science team trimmed it down to four possibilities and then selected this one. And at the end of the day, the argument, you go home at night, you sleep on it, you get really worried. You don't want to pick a dud. You'd like to pick something good. And the argument that we like the best is the most primitive observation of all. There's a topographic gradient. You can see channels just like were discovered back in the 60s that are cutting across here. The topographic depression here, the depth here, this is the lowest depth except for this little crater. It's even lower in depth than the northern plains are for a thousand kilometers in any direction. And if water is going to flow downhill, that's the simplest argument. So we actually picked it based on that. But what's the mountain doing there? So there was some work done by Mike Malin and Ked Edgett, who are really the pioneers of, of sedimentary geology on Mars. And, they, and, and Malin worked with Bob Sharp, who was a legendary figure in the field of planetary geology. And he got interested in why all these big craters on Mars, some of them seem to be filled in. And so he proposed, based on their observations, a sort of a, a history or a phylogeny of the evolution of a crater going from some real big ones that are completely filled in. And they must have been filled in a long time ago because the, the infill itself is impacted by a number of, of substantially large craters. But you can go around the planet, and as you go around like this, you can see that something's happening, and you're beginning to emerge a plateau with kind of a moat around the middle, and Gale represented the end member of that continuum. And so this was very influential, and I, I certainly thought it was a good hypothesis that maybe what you would see in the middle is an eroded stack of layers rather than a volcano. And so the simplest explanation for the mountain in the middle, because going all the way back to the 60s, the first order hypothesis for Mars is that Mars is a volcanic planet. Today, I would say that Mars is an aeolian planet. It's a windy planet, and any rock that you're likely to see, if it's not a lava flow, could be an aeolian deposit. We have to be very careful about that when we do our paleoenvironmental reconstructions. But the risk in going here is that we would spend $2.5 billion on the rover and arrive at a volcano, and it is just exactly like Hawaii. The other interpretation is, is that if you look down and you begin to see the layers here, yes, those could be lava flows, but if they're sedimentary deposits, then maybe the ones that are down at the bottom, where the crater was the deepest, could be associated with water, maybe even a, a body of uh, standing water like a lake. Okay, so let me say a little bit about Curiosity. Uh, Curiosity is the result of 30 years of, of engineering. The story begins back in 1997 when the Sojourner uh, rover arrives on the surface of Mars, uh, 4th of July, 1997. It was considered to be a technology demonstration, and that was entirely political because NASA had undergone a series of, of pretty spectacular failures. You've probably all heard about the orbiter that, or the polar lander that had the English to metric conversion problem. Uh, you know, credibility was on the line here. So this was actually not called a mission. It was called a technology demonstration. And so if it didn't, if it didn't work, then you couldn't say the mission failed. <laughs> it's a true story. And, uh, and it worked spectacularly well. The engineering step forward here was to build a mobile platform, six-wheel drive, rocker bogey suspension, and the rocker bogey suspension gives the ability of the vehicle to drive over an object the diameter of the wheel without tilting the rover deck, which is where all the solar panels are. And that's your energy source. You don't want the solar panels to tilt away from the sun. You want to keep the vehicle flat. Uh, it, the cameras were on the lander, and so Pathfinder was on its own, but it was never commanded outside of the area about the size of what you see right here. But it worked as a proof of concept. NASA got the green light to go ahead and build for the next decade, Spirit and Opportunity, two rovers, because again, they're worried about losing it, and so if one crashes, you still have another, so you double down and you minimize your risk of mission failure. Both rovers together are called a mission, so if one fails, then one works, it's still a successful mission. 
It turned out they both worked. Spirit lasted, they were built to last three months and drive 300 meters. Spirit lasted seven years and Opportunity is still driving to this day, having gone 45 kilometers and lasted 12 years. Uh, but it's solar, and you, can, you see the pedigree here, the same rocker bogey suspension, but now the cameras are on the rover and it's free to be its own ship of exploration. So those rovers discovered evidence, mineralogical evidence, that there really was water involved in the formation of these layered rocks on Mars. And then that gave the green light to go ahead and build Curiosity, which again, uh, as a decade of design and, and engineering and construction, and then uh, it lands in August 5th, 2012. Same thing again, six-wheel drive, rocker bogey suspension. Um, the one thing you don't see now are, are the solar panels, what drops in the back here, the last thing before they launch the vehicle uh, in Florida, with permission of the governor of Florida, is a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is NASA code for a nuclear power source. And it generates about 100 watts of power per hour that we use to operate all of the subsystems on the rover. The mass spectrometers that I won't talk much about because it's a general talk, but all of our science instruments, all of the motors, 39 motors that make the wheels turn, make the camera turret work, make the arm go out, reach around, and so on and so forth. So we have batteries, lithium ion batteries. We can store energy and, and produce power off the grid when we do operations at night or when they're particularly power intensive. But the arm out here in the front is really the workhorse of this mission. It, it sticks out, extends about two meters. The arm has five degrees of freedom, just like our own arm does. And out in the front is 60 kilograms of, of instruments, science instruments, plus a drill, a rotary percussion drill that allows us to get down about seven uh, centimeters into the rock, collect the powder, and feed it into an X-ray diffraction instrument and a quadrupole mass spectrometer. Okay, why do these things work? I get this question a lot of time. Why is NASA successful at this? And just like a realtor has, you've all heard the location, location, location thing, this is ours. Test as you fly, fly as you test. We test everything that we're gonna fly and we don't fly anything that can't be tested. And then when we get on the ground, we never do anything that we can't test in the test bed. So when a, an engineer or a scientist comes up with a brand new activity that's gonna use the rover in some weird way, we have to be able to test it on the ground first. And we certify that activity for flight before we send up the command sequence to actually execute it on the surface of Mars. And that's why these rovers live so long. It's not that they're just, they're built really well, but they're also operated in an extremely responsible way. So what this engineering is, this engineering is doing here is uh, she's got a wand, and at the end of it is a, is a, uh, is a thermistor that's gonna measure the skin temperature of the rover, which is being irradiated with a light source that has the same power that the sun does on Mars, in order to check how the skin temperatures are varying, to check against numerical models and computers that predict the thermal behavior of the rover, because what happens is the rover is three meters long, the arm is sticking out another uh, two meters, the whole thing is made out of aluminum and titanium, and it actually, it, during the diurnal 100 degree centigrade variation, can expand and contract by two centimeters. So if you're drilling, and all of a sudden you don't get the drill bit out in time and the sun goes down, you could have a problem. So we, the number one cause of mission failure for all kinds of spacecraft is thermal behavior. Okay, a little bit of story for the engineers. Um, here's our launch vehicle. It's an Atlas 541 configuration. Uh, the the, uh, the 4-1 represents uh, the configuration of the rocket motors. The 1 in the middle uh, is a liquid-fueled rocket that is a decommissioned Soviet IB, ICBM uh, that we buy from them because we don't have any more. We got rid of all ours and they didn't. And, uh, and so what goes on the side are then the four in the configuration are four solid rocket uh, boosters. That jumps it up really quickly and then the liquid stage comes involved and that really takes it out of the Earth's uh, uh, gravitational influence. Uh, Curiosity's up here at the top. Uh, this is a picture that I was actually able to take with my iPhone 
uh, the night before launch, somebody gave me a tip and said, yeah, with your JPL badge, you can just drive right into the swamp and just look way over yonder, and you're going to see this white light looking up at a rocket. And you can get up close to it. And I got there just as a photographer was getting off duty, and he gave me his pass, and I went through security and went in and stood next to the rocket and took a picture. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a video in a minute that goes pretty quickly, and it features the lead engineers for the development of the landing system, because no matter how much great science we do, it's equally awesome to appreciate the, the quality of the engineering that goes into one of these missions. So the challenge of landing on Mars, it's very different from the moon, is that Mars has an atmosphere and Mars also has real gravity, and both of those uh, present challenges. So what happens is, and I've rounded off the powers of 10 here, uh, you enter the atmosphere at about 10,000 miles an hour. Um, the heat shield uh, uh, dissipates a lot of the energy due to friction. It slows it down to about 1,000 miles an hour. Parachute deploys. So far, all of this is the same as every other mission, with one big exception that as the aeroshell, which is the heat shield plus the back shell, as the aeroshell is entering the atmosphere, it actually has a reaction control system, a bunch of thrusters up at the top, and <clears throat> we give it a target that it seeks based on its own inertial navigation system, and any deviations from the predicted target are compensated by an onboard computer that does real-time uh, adjustments using the reaction control system so the thing flies through the atmosphere a little bit. And because of that, we can steer it, so to speak, towards a landing site, and that is incredibly important for science because that's what allows us to get from a landing ellipse that is 100 kilometers in diameter, long axis, down to, down to 20. And that's how we were able to get the gale. So once the parachute deploys, we then slow down to about 100 miles an hour, and the problem is, at, at this point, uh, the rover still has enough energy. You can't, you can't crash land it. Pathfinder and Spirit and Opportunity both landed in this funky airbag configuration. So at this point in the, in the, in the descent, what would happen is the heat shield would fall off. The, the vehicle would, would reach its terminal velocity. And at that point, it would just drop the rover free surrounded by airbags, and it would literally crash land by bouncing to the surface, and then it dissipates its energy that way. And then the rover, the airbags retract, the, the, the rover opens up, and, it, and it, it's ready to drive away. But the problem is the thing's too massive this time. It literally weighs a ton, and so the force due to impact, there's no airbags that people can engineer that would withstand the force, so you have to come down on rockets. But the problem is, is that the rover has no protection, and the reason it has no protection is the protection itself adds risk that the protection might not come off, allowing the rover to drive away. So in a trade-off of risk, the engineers decided it was much better to have the powered descent vehicle hover about 20 meters above the ground and reel the cable out on a bridle until it touches down on the surface cut the cables, this thing then flies off and crashes, and you're good to go. And uh, anyway, you can see for yourself what happened here. I lost the sound. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. There we go. This is very natural. This is how we look at it. It looks crazy. It is the result of recent to make it to Earth, that's how far Mars is away. So, when we first get word that we touch the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive, we're dead, and we for at least seven minutes. After the second landing, also known as the EL, you refer to the seven minutes of terror. Because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour 
to zero. Perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself. If then any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. Instead of the atmosphere, it developed so much aerodynamic drag out of each year. It heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to do, otherwise it will destroy your space track. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about a thousand miles an hour. So that point we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built today. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force. It's even with a parachute itself it only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's the next snapping nine genes. At that point, you have to get that feature locked. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to get just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and come down on rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we don't do something. We're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical that we're fly off to the sun, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land, and we can straight down to the bottom of the crater, right beside a six kilometer high. We can't get those rocket engines to the ground because if we were to descend impulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this mass dust cloud, a dust cloud that is going to land on the rover and contain its mechanisms and contain its engines. So the way we solve that problem is by using a sky ring. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its feet, on the surface. As the rover has done, it's now on the ground. In the same state, it's in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the drive immediately and fly to the same stage to a safe distance from the road. <laughs> so, so it worked. Uh, it was, uh, this is the point of the mission where uh, Curiosity lands at Earth time at uh, 1029 p.m. California. The science team is there. There's about 530 scientists on the team now. And, uh, <clears throat> and now we have to go to work because there's a little data that comes down. But I, and I just want to say a few words about that because <clears throat> this is the first moment of tension between science and engineering because the scientists want to get the data and get on with the mission. And the engineers want to make sure the curiosity is okay. So the overwhelming majority of the bits of information that come down uh, at this moment are engineering data that tell you about everything from vehicle state of health to instrument state of health. And <clears throat> at this particular time, Earth, of course, is not visible uh, visibly, uh, but you can see it uh, with radio waves. And so. What's happening is, is that Curiosity is sending that information before Earth set on Mars. And so we get a little bit of data before we then have to go to looking at orbiters and, and basically sending information to orbiters <coughs> that then gets ricocheted back to Earth. <coughs> and out of this came a negotiated agreement to get a picture 
of the wheel that shows that the vehicle is actually on the ground because the public doesn't understand semaphore tones and we would actually like to have a picture to show people that we actually land on the ground. So everybody's jumping up and down in the back of the room for the first time because the thing worked and the second time because this, this picture came down. And this is one of the hazard avoidance cameras and it's got a, a dust cover on it uh, <clears throat> that protects the lens at landing because there's so much stuff flying around because of the rocket motors. And, and what you can see is the, is the shadow of the rover and, and this image has taken 10 seconds after landing. And then what we do is uh, we, get a, we get the first, that data came back to Earth. That's what we saw first. The next one that comes back is 39 minutes later when the first orbiter comes overhead. And we're, we get a little bit of data on that one too. It's still mostly engineering data. You can see the shadow of the, of the rover lengthening here because it's 39 minutes later, closer to sunset uh, on, on Mars. So with that, the science team goes off and says, where are we? And so all the people that do navigation, there's Mount Sharp. This was amazing luck that we could see the mountain that we wanted to go to. And right away, the science team is trying to figure out where we are. So everybody goes back, and not a lot of people can do that. Mostly people are just hanging out, having a good time. The engineers all go off and have a great party, and they're officially now unemployed because they've been <laughs> successful. And, uh, and then we wake up the next day. We all go to bed, and we wake up the next day, and this is what we find. <laughs> The world is watching. And I honestly, this was a big learning point for me because I kind of thought that maybe the world would be bored with rovers on Mars. But I think the, the very important thing happened, this was a milestone in the impact of, of, of social media, is that everybody was telling their friends about this thing. And that video, we knew it would get hit a lot, but we had no idea how much it would happen. It was served by Google. It had almost a billion hits. It crashed their server. And it turned out that was the most watched landing in the history of space science. And then what we learned was is that what do you get for two and a half billion bucks if you're the average person? You get to have a good time. And, and I have always been amazed at what people can actually do with our data to enjoy themselves with this. And the cost of this mission to the taxpayers of this country is about half the cost of a movie. So if you went to the Martian and liked it, you could pay half that much and participate in this. Okay, so then we take, the first thing we do is take three, 360 degree panoramas, but that data is massive, especially in color, because it's HD resolution. And, uh, and so we can send it back to Earth, but we only get half of the data in the first day. And here we are looking. We've been so fixated on this mountain in the middle, we forgot about the, the, the crater rim, which makes its own imposing mountain range. It's two kilometers in elevation. Um, and the foreground is the typical view that you see every other mission that landed beginning with Viking. And the interesting thing about that is that it's a gravelly plain with lots of gray rocks strewn around. It doesn't look very interesting. But because of this landing system, the landing system was able to get us into this moat between the rim and the mountain that's on the other side here. But the most amazing part was the reason that we came was to look for evidence of layering, and here it is in the background. And the problem is, is that this, this layering is towards the crater rim. It's not towards the mountain, and that will become important in a minute. So then the next day, the rest of the data comes down, and here's our first look at the mountain, uh, close up with the 100 millimeter zoom lens. And what we can see from this are the lower foothills of Mount Sharp. These are the layers that we look down from orbit for uh, um, you know, over 10 years and, and for about five years looking at the spectral signatures. And we don't know what, how these layers got here, but what we know is that they were somehow formed in the presence of water or altered in the presence of water. And so we just have to drive across this gravelly plain, cross this dune field over here, and then head up into the promised land. And it, it really looks surprisingly like a great place to go. Um, definitely still my favorite picture of the whole mission. Okay, so here's why we wanted to go to the mountain. This is a map of the, the kinds of materials that we see from orbit. We landed here where we thought we needed to go was over into here, especially getting up into this orange and green band where from orbit we saw hematite, we saw clays, the sulfates. This is where we thought everything was gonna be, the action was gonna get going uh, based on what we saw from orbit. But we saw these layers 
and, and you will notice this, this dog leg in the wrong direction. Here's a different kind of map uh, from orbit. This is just topography. This is our landing ellipse, which is uh, 20 kilometers in the, in, the, in the long axis here. Coming out of the crater rim is a valley, the typical kind of valley that's cut by water. There's evidence for what geologists call an alluvial fan. You guys have these a lot up and down the Wasatch Front here. And, and you can see ancient channels, raised ridges that, that look like inverted channels. And so when we placed the landing ellipse here, we wanted to snug it as close to the mountain as possible, but it can't be too close because if you get fractionally a lot of the area in the lips with these high slopes, that's dangerous because this is a, a two sigma error ellipse for where the rover is most likely to land, and there's some chance that you could land outside of the ellipse, but probably you're gonna land within the ellipse, and so you wanna keep it nice and flat and boring. And that's why we landed on the gravel. But what we were hoping was is that maybe out in front of this fan, you can see the topographic gradient going from higher elevations to lower elevations. Anywhere we landed in here, water flows downhill, maybe we'd find some geological evidence for it. It wasn't a lot more sophisticated than that. So then we overlay a second kind of a map. And now the colors here represent a property called thermal inertia. And this is the ability of rocks to retain heat. So if you walk past a, a concrete building late in the afternoon on a, on a cool fall afternoon, you feel that heat radiating towards you, that's the rock in that building retaining its heat and giving it back off later into the day. So this is a map that is made at night on Mars that is looking down and it's literally looking at the rocks glowing. So the redder it is, the more heat they're giving off late at night. And isn't it interesting that out in front of this alluvial fan, there's a lot of the, 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 the rocks that have the highest thermal inertia. So then the argument starts, and this was known before we landed, and so some people are saying, yes, John, that's because there's a lot of black uh, lava flows there, and they're keeping a lot of heat and giving it off, and that was a real concern. Other people on the team would say, how do we know that there aren't lake beds there, and they've been cemented by minerals, and it's actually a rock rather than a sediment? It's an equally viable hypothesis. So we didn't know, but all we did know is that we landed here, just slightly off a of dead center. That's like teeing off from Tokyo, aiming for the Empire State Building and missing by one window. That's the accumulated error. And, and so, but because of that, we wound up right next to some of this red stuff. The red stuff, the layering, we just couldn't resist going over there. So I had to fly to Washington and convince NASA we weren't crazy that, to not be going right towards the, the mountain because that's what we told the media and everybody we were going to be doing. Here's the other thing, a little bit of geology here. Where we landed was right here. All I want to point out is that in this map, it doesn't matter what these units are, uh, we landed right near a triple junction of the units. And any time a geologist gets a three-fur, that becomes irresistible. <laughs> so off we went. <clears throat> That's the way, this is the way I explained it to NASA. You know, look, guys, it's only five football fields. It's not the end of the world. Uh, here's Curiosity, the white dot in the middle. She has a, a, a white deck, so very high albedo. This image is a false color image. Uh, these pixels are saturated, and the butterfly wings are where the thrusters blew all of the soil away to bedrock. And then the, the dark that you see here is where the fresh, most recent dust of Mars was blown away. So <clears throat> this is a, a terrain. This is one of our map units called the, the hummocky terrain, for obvious reasons. This one was called the cratered terrain. And this one was called the light tone fractured terrain. And, uh, and so Glen Elg was the triple junction between them, and so we decided to go over here, drive downhill towards these layers into this topographic depression and see what was going on there. Here's what it looked like when we got there. We're looking down into the depression of this light tone fractured terrain. We drove the rover around these outcrops that we called the diving platforms, and then down into the valley right about here, and, and when we got there, as we crossed this boundary, all kinds of good stuff started to happen. This is a typical rock that we saw. Um, uh, Margie Chan was the first person to write a paper on the opportunity data to say that all those rounded balls, I saw some out here on the stands, these milky marbles, they are great analogs for concretions. And frankly, that's what we found at, at Meridiani. And then here we are again, seeing a rock that is loaded with a bunch of rounded balls 
But this time, unlike what we had at Meridiani, the rock is fractured and filled in with a lot of veins of light tone material that we got one of our instruments out, which is a, a laser that we can zap at the rocks and get a qualitative sense of their chemistry. And that told us that they were made out of calcium sulfate. And so this rock just looked like it had a rich history of interacting with water. But we still didn't know that it wasn't a lava flow. So <clears throat> this was the first hole that we drilled into the rock. And what you can see in the hole are the veins, the light tone veins that are, we now know are filled with the sulfate minerals. These things are all over the place. Here's where we shot the hole with the laser afterwards. And you can see all the, the marks where the laser interacted with the rock. <clears throat> but I waited up till about 2.30 in the morning that night because that's when the telemetry was coming down from Mars because what I wanted to see was the rate of penetration. So the way the drill works is that you put the drill down on the rock and you push it against it with a preload of about 300 newtons and then you tell it to drill for some period of time. And either the rock goes to the maximum depth of penetration or more likely the rock goes down slowly enough that after one hour it stops drilling anyway. So you go to the total depth or, or the limit, the time limit. Turned out when the data came back, this thing went all the way to the total depth in seven minutes. <laughs> so that didn't seem like a lava flow. And so now we began to think, maybe this really is some kind of a, a, a sedimentary deposit. It turned out to be a lake bed, and I'm gonna skip that story because I'm gonna show you some better stuff that we found since then. Here's the most important thing uh, that comes out of the compositional information. And for the non-geologists, if you take the kind of rock that you find in Hawaii and, and you look at the typical minerals in it, this is most of, of what you get, plagioclase, augite, pigeonite, olivine. The important thing is, is that this was our, our kind of a baseline. This was soil that we scooped up on the surface of Mars as our first attempt to use our instruments, and here's what we get. And look at this one in particular, olivine's present at 20%, and in the rock that we just drilled, it goes down to 4%, which is really low. And a mineral that's not present in the surficial materials that are on the surface of Mars is now present at the 20 to 30% level. This was the original presentation of the data. We've refined these numbers much more since then. The other important thing that really picks up is magnetite. Both of these minerals we think formed by the presence of water interacting with these igneous minerals, redistributing their elements from the original minerals into new minerals in a closed system weathering kind of a situation. Here's what the rock looks like, and, and this is the way that I like to explain it to a general audience. Ten years ago when we landed with the Opportunity Rover, we got really excited. Here are the rounded balls, which is where all the hematite was, all the iron oxides. But what we found was we didn't have a drill on that mission, but we could grind away with like sandpaper. And when we ground it, every geologist learns that if a rock has hematite in it and you grind it on a porcelain rough plate, it will produce red powder. So this is us finding red powder. Now, if you look at Mars today, the reason it's a red planet is because of the anhydrous iron oxides that are there. So we landed and we found an ancient rock that is billions of years old but it also had a lot of hematite in it. It was exciting because it formed in water, but it was not so exciting from the point of view of habitability, as I'll talk more about in a minute, because what wasn't made out of hematite was made out of very large quantities of salt, in particular magnesium sulfate. What we found with curiosity, what you get with your taxpayer money in 10 years of research, is picking a landing site that has a better probability of finding something that's more attractive from a habitability point of view. So this for me is another iconic image of the planet because now we drill down and the rock powder that we produce is not red, it's gray. And it is basically sitting on top of the red dust that makes the planet red from when we view it from Earth. And the difference is, is that we drilled into a rock that was lacustrine, and this comes from a Triassic uh, uh, lake basin out in, in the Hartford area. Uh, and, and these rocks have iron minerals in them, and the rock is gray because those iron minerals, iron bearing minerals, are not oxidized. This rock is red. This is the famous brownstone building rock. If you go to Boston, New York, D.C., and you look at the brownstones, it all comes from the same age rocks, Triassic age rocks. They're all red beds, and in here the iron has been oxidized, and that's why it's red. These rocks don't tend to preserve organic carbon. 
Oil companies don't look for red rocks to generate oil and gas. They look for gray rocks because the organic matter in there is preserved. So for us, this got really exciting because we thought that we were onto the, the route of finding uh, something interesting. So I'm gonna jump ahead and show a whole bunch of data. We then did a lot of drilling, but this is a paper that was published recently. Now we do look for organic compounds, and we have found some. We also have contamination that we have to worry about from Earth. And so this is, this is the most complex compound that we've found. And it's the most complicated slide I'm gonna show you. And all this does is, is show that there's more of it. So the higher the bar gets, the more there is of this stuff. And down here are the, are the samples that we drilled. This is the modern soil of Mars. This was the first hole that we drilled. And then what we did was we bumped the rover two meters to drive into a very high concentration of these concretions, thinking that if the minerals that make the concretions, like these moky marbles, if those come in really early, maybe they're gonna lock up any organics that might have been there, and lo and behold, the concentration of that material goes up. We don't know what this means. We're not even sure what it comes from, but we, we think it's not contamination, and we waited to publish the paper until we drilled another hole afterwards, and it went back down again. And so if it was Earth, we would do this over and over and over and over again, but we only have one rover on Mars, and the clock is ticking, and so we have to move on. So we actually feel that this ancient lake deposit there was something going on there that allowed some kind of organic matter to be preserved. Okay, 10 years ago, this is the slide I would have showed you to explain what we discovered when we found those red hematite sulfate bearing rocks on Mars. And, and around here, folks know a lot about the mining industry, but there is a place in Spain called Rio Tinto. And, and the Rio is Tinto because iron is soluble at pH one and in the Fe3 plus state for the chemists in the audience. And so what's amazing about this is that this is a great analog for what we found 10 years ago, because what's precipitating on here is a mineral called jarosite, that's this yellowish color. That's the potassium sulfate that performs at very low uh, pH, and you get the iron oxides forming there too. But the problem is, this is a habitable environment on Earth, just barely for acidophilic extremophiles, microorganisms that like to live in acidic fluid. But the problem was with the rock that we found on Mars is that that rock is 50% by weight salt. It's just too salty. And I have a little explanation for that in a minute, but keep that in mind. Instead, this is what we found. You could probably find other places on Earth. This was one where I happened to do some field work in South Australia, and they have these little uh, uh, playa basins that form next to the ocean. The rocks that are covered with grasses here are, are made out of basalt, which is the same kind of rock that we think we have on Mars. And if you just ignore these higher grasses, we don't think we had any of those on Mars. Um, we do wonder if we had microbes, and it turns out that if you dig down into one of these things, you find all of the same igneous minerals that we had found in that drill hole on Mars, and you find the same type of clay, this iron magnesium smectite, as we call it. And in here, there's plenty of microbes growing there, down deep, they don't need sunlight. They're growing off of the chemical energy that these minerals provide. So this is the way that I like to explain it, as simply as possible. 10 years ago, what we found was honey. We did find water on Mars. But the problem is it takes more than water to make a habitable planet. And the reason that the honey doesn't go off on your shelf is the water activity is too low. It's just not enough water in there. There's water enough for it to flow, but microbes can't live in there because the water gets sucked right out of the microbes. So that's what we found 10 years ago, but what we found at Gale Lake was some of the lowest salt contents that had been measured anywhere on Mars. Uh, very low chlorine, very low, low sulfur. No evidence really for any salts where we drilled that rock. And instead, uh, the simple explanation about the chemical energy is if you just take a battery, you put a light bulb in between it, hook up the, hook up the, the wires, the light bulb's gonna glow because you have solid material that creates a source of energy. Microbes do the same thing with rocks and minerals. They can actually harvest energy by literally breathing things like iron that are in the minerals. So there's no problem 
doesn't mean we found life on Mars. I don't know if there's life on Mars. But if there had been life on Mars, this would be the kind of environment that could have supported it. So that's what we, that's what we discovered in finding a habitable environment. So then we moved on, and now we wanted to go to the mountain. We wound up spending a lot of time there because we kind of hit the jackpot. Here's a view from orbit. This is about halfway to the mountain. You can see the rover's tracks here zigzagging along. And in, in a second, I'm going to show you uh, some images that we took when the rover was parked here. Wherever you see these donuts, the rover was spinning around to get the antenna oriented towards Earth or a satellite. And, and so then what we do is we work our way around the outcrop and then we pulled up to this outcrop here where we drilled another hole. But what you can see here, again, this one's kind of for the geologists in the audience. This is a terrain we saw from orbit. We called it the strided terrain. We didn't know what it was. And what we did know is that it was striking right along into what also looked like a layered terrain, which is flat lying relative to whatever the heck these striations are. And we never expected. We had a lot of guesses about what it might be, but we didn't think it was going to be this. What we found when we got to the striated terrain are layers that are dipping systematically towards Mount Sharp. And these layers are deposited by flowing water. It's a delta. It's just like the Gilbert-type deltas that you have out here, but it's made out of sand instead of gravel. There is a little bit of gravel in here, but it's mostly sand. And so these dipping layers indicate the flow of water, but the paradox is, for 9 out of 10 scientists that are on the mission, is, wait a minute, John, how can we have water flowing across the, the surface here? It's it, because we're driving uphill towards the mountain. We're looking uphill. The answer is, is that it's because the mountain was built out of layers and it's been exhumed and the topography of the planet today is no guide at all to the topography of the ancient depositional environments. So what we have done is to exhume a complex of ancient deltas and lakes. So it kind of works like this. This is a simple cross-section of the, the kind that geologists like to draw. We have river deposits that are being created by erosion of the crater rim. Water flows downhill, it transports these gravels into things that look like deltas with dipping layers that dip towards uh, the mountain. But the reason why the layers are dipping, at, at each sequence of layers goes upward in elevation is because there must have been a lake deposit and with time the crater was filling in and each younger delta is marching out as the crater fills in. So it's a rich set of conclusions uh, that, that took us a long time to come to grips with. Very interesting. What I wanted to do now is turn to a little bit of the chemistry, again, uh, for uh, some of the scientists in the audience here to, to show you what is our most exciting and unpublished results that we're working on right now. And it, it involves the chemistry of the lake deposits that, that we found. The, the first ones that we drilled were down here in a relatively older age. Now we've gone uphill about 100 meters, and we're into younger lake deposits. And this is what happens if you take the gray rocks and compare them to the white rocks. The gray rocks are all in blue. The red rocks are all in red. And this is aluminum concentration versus silicon concentration. What's really exciting is, to some degree, they overlap, and that's good, because they share things in common. But what's really interesting are these very high silica values that are coming off here to extreme end member compositions. <clears throat> At this point in the history of Mars science, 9 out of 10 people would say, when you take a basaltic rock and you expose it to sulfuric acid, it's going to be weathered and leached away, and you're going to leave all the silica behind. And that's what some people think is going on here. But when you take those kinds of rocks, here now is silica versus a more complicated parameter that I put in here just for the geochemist. This measures weathering. This is the degree to which a rock has been weathered. And what we find is these are the rocks that were transported by rivers. These are the rocks that were, that were deposited in the lake. And these are rocks from Hawaii that were exposed to acidic weathering, where the silica concentration does go up because everything else is being leached away. But we see a very different behavior here. What's again happening is that we're pulling out in a direction that just indicates simple silica addition. It's like you took all these rocks and just moved them over by adding silica. And now a little bit of mineralogy. Uh, here's our lake deposit. 
uh, that we, about 14 meters of it. We drilled four holes through it. And down at the bottom, here is hematite magnetite. Watch what happens there. The rocks are dominated by hematite. They also have little bits of jarosite in them too, just like we found 10 years ago, but just a touch, maybe two to four percent rather than 50 percent. And we've got clays. But then when you go up to these holes up here, look what happens. The magnetite dominates over the hematite, so it's a more reducing environment. And in addition to that, we get a ton of opal and silica coming in. And in this hole in particular, we get a lot of crystalline silica coming in there as well. And when it's a little bit of quartz. It's more uh, crystobolite. And actually, we found a fair amount of tritomite in there as well. So we're not sure uh, exactly what these mean, but we believe that some of these sediments are derived maybe from felsic igneous rocks and that the opal is become, uh, becoming available in this lake environment. So what do these rocks look like? Well, we got really excited when we found uh, laminated deposits that we thought made a good case for a lake bed, and Margie turns out to have been the reviewer for that. And here's the latest installment. <clears throat> Those lake beds that we found ranged in thickness from one centimeter down to two millimeters. Now here's a rock where we have, uh, where the, the average um, the mean lamination thickness here is half a millimeter, but the rock is compositionally about 75% SiO2. This looks like a laminated silica deposit. It's kind of hard to get around any other explanation, and the best analog that I can find for you is to go back to rocks that are billions of years on Earth, uh, rocks called iron formation that also have hematite magnetite in them, more on Earth than what we're seeing on Mars, but there's also a lot of silica in here as well, deposited at a millimeter scale. So we think in this lake, it wasn't just accumulating detrital sediment, it may have also been precipitating uh, minerals as well. And so uh, this leads me towards the end here and to what I think is, is the beginning of, of different types of comparative planetary evolution. What you've probably heard the most about are the discovery of all these exoplanets, and, and this one in particular is probably the most Earth-like. There are hundreds of these things being turned up all the time, and we're able to look at them, compare them to our own solar system, and ask which ones of these might be similar to Earth. But what we're beginning to do now for the first time on Mars, and, and this is a game of the, the overall properties of the planet, but what we can begin to do now for Mars is explore the details of its environmental history through its rock record. So here's some rocks. If you want to go see the oldest sedimentary rocks on Earth that can tell you about Earth's early environment, you go to Western Australia or South Africa. This happens to be Western Australia. These rocks are dominantly silica. They're in part iron formation. And they were deposited, we know very well, 3.4 billion years ago. Given the age uncertainties that we've got for the rocks that we have seen, we believe that these rocks were deposited approximately 3.4 billion years ago. And so as we are driving along and looking at these layers that we see in here, we can actually begin to ask, what was Mars doing at Gale Crater uh, at the same time Earth was doing something over in Western Australia? And plus or minus a couple hundred million years, it's a pretty reasonable comparison. So what was Mars doing at Gale Crater? Um, a lot of the folks here are interested in isotope geochemistry, so I, I just wanted to throw this in a little bit because it's so fascinating. We take the clays that come out of those rocks that are about 3.4 billion years ago. We put them into our, our analyzer where we have an oven that we can heat the rocks up and burn them, literally. And at about 700 degrees, 750 degrees, the water comes off in the clay minerals that was bound in there three and a half billion years ago. And we can take that water, feed it along to a tunable laser spectrometer and measure its isotope ratio. And what we find out is that on Earth today, here's its inventory of water in this parameter that, that ratios deuterium to hydrogen. That's Earth's isotope ratio. Here's what we see in Mars today, but what we measure in these ancient clays is something that's sort of halfway in the middle. And so we know that Mars has lost a lot of its atmosphere, but what this tells us is there was still water around. And if you quantify that, you ask, what was all that water that's been lost 
between this time and that time, it turns out to be about 100 to 150 meters thickness of water spread around the surface of Mars. That's about what that is. <clears throat> but that's a geochemical view of the property of the entire planet. The question is, where is that water distributed? And that's where these rocks come in, because the only way we're going to know where that water reservoir was is by looking at the, at the rock record. And so this is the last slide that I wanted to show, and it is comparative planetary evolution. This is a rock that is about two billion years ago from southern Canada. It was deposited in an ancient glacial marine environment when there was a lot of ice on Earth, and, ice was, and Earth was cold. And we deposited layers of sediment at the scale of centimeters as a seasonal phenomena. This is one of our best rocks that we have seen in a facies which we believe is more proximal to the delta. And here we go to exactly the same scale of layering. It's a centimeter scale. It's quite far away. It's a little bit foggy, and I'd like it to be that way because we can never be too certain about exactly what we're inferring from Mars. But we believe that this is telling us geologically that, that some of that 100 to 150 meters of water was filling that lake, and that meant that the lake had to be in equilibrium with the atmosphere. And that's a very different environment that we have today. So this is the last slide. This is where this all gets you. And, and I'll just finish by saying that I think we're now en engaging in a, another one of these great geological controversies where geologists observe something like the evidence for a lake but there are climate scientists that are trying to understand the dynamics of how Mars's would have ever been warm enough unless it's got a big inventory of greenhouse gases and people can't find that inventory. And so the climate modelers look at the geologists and say, you guys need to go back and question your assumptions. And the geologists look at the climate modelers and say, you, you guys need to go back and question your assumptions. So something's missing somewhere but I think that's, that's where we are right now in trying to understand the history of Mars. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be coming up pretty quickly. Uh, I don't know where it'll be. Um, there are several different varieties. I've, because of this work, um, there are other lake systems that, that might come up for grabs. There are also, if you go to the very oldest rock record of Mars, when people think there might have been more hydrothermal systems, there's an option as well. Uh, but I think that they would like to choose the landing site maybe a few years before ours because the next robot's going to be more automated than ours was. And so the, the sooner you know where you're going, the more you can plan for what it should be doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I noticed when you were showing the uh, breakdown of the three time periods on Mars observed through the um, meteorological differences as well as the crater density, that there was Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting that the boundaries are that close. Um, it, it's, it's probably, I'm not sure what it means scientifically because the, the people that are making the measurements are, are trying to tune them to those, those boundaries. And so they will tend to, to push, because you don't know whether it's Noachian or Hesperian. If it's got clay, you'll probably tend to put it in the Noachian bin. Yeah. Yeah. Can you describe for us what your personal work environment is like? Uh, well, it's changed since I'm not the chief scientist anymore. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it was very intense. Uh, you know, I worked as a science team member on the mission 10 years ago, and that's a much simpler rover. And it is possible for a relatively small group of people, meaning maybe in a day 10 scientists working with 15 engineers, to, to figure out what it is that the science team wants to do with the vehicle, and then build command sequences that the engineers can actually have confidence in. And at the end of the day, that will all pass muster with the mission manager. And then you press the button and radiate the command sequence up there. 
This vehicle with 10 instruments, and including the mass spectrometers, whose behavior you have to know exceptionally well, there are so many things you have to keep track of that you need about 30 scientists um, <clears throat> actively engaged, another 30 or 40 scientists in the back room that are checking parameters for their instruments, and then a lot of engineers to put it all together. It's very stressful to this day, four years into it, it, it takes the it takes the team probably 12 to 15 hours a day to do that. So it's not possible for one person to go on leading that capably. And I, I think that we're looking now at a future of Mars exploration where it's more like the ocean drilling project, where a team of people come in and they operate the vehicle, the ship, very capably for a, a short period of time, enough to get some good science out of it, and then they hand the keys over to somebody else. Because the, the, the robot, and that's the reason we're going to go automated, is it's just, it, there's too much chance for human error in, involved in this. So to eliminate that, we work very long hours. But otherwise, it was richly rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I don't quite understand the, uh, the sediments. Uh, were they buried at great depths to compact them into rocks, and then at a later time, the overburden was eroded away? Thank you for asking that question. I forgot that I have one last slide, uh, but this answers your question. We, these, the, 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 the brown is supposed to be the times when the lake was there, and the, uh, the yellows uh, represent the time when it might have been drier with windblown materials and so on and so forth. But we think we did. There should be a central peak here in the middle that's produced when the crater itself is created. And so we didn't show that just because it was a complication. But, but we do believe that thing filled up and then was eroded away. And we do see these fracture networks are very pervasive. And uh, it, it's, it's hard to do the rock mechanics because our data is so primitive. But we, we think that there could have been hundreds of meters to maybe kilometers of burial. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, we don't have the, uh, I spent, before landing, I spent most of my time talking to the media about how we don't have any way to tell if life was there. Even if there were active microbes respiring on the surface, we have no way to detect their metabolism. <clears throat> we could scoop them up and find organics, uh, but there's one big lesson I learned for the folks with more interest in geochemistry. I think this will be the last time NASA flies a mission that does pyrolysis, because what's happening is the, the, these environments on Mars turn out to pick up a lot of a, a substance called uh, perchlorate. And these oxychlorine compounds, when we heat the rock up, are a source of, of oxidants that we think are taking the organic molecules and just ripping them apart. And, and so we, we know we've got more organics here and there, we just don't know their identity. So, I, so we, I suppose even if you found an amino acid, you wouldn't know it was meteoritic. Um, there's other things we can do with chirality, but it would have been really dicey. I think the best hope is to find places like this, and I might be the first person to vote to never go back there because it's a big planet. I think you should have confidence in your geological models and go to a different lake and learn something different about the planet. But bring the materials back to Earth. That's what the next mission will do, and analyze them using much better instrumentation. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit like the question we had, we had before. Um, I, I think it's just completely coincidental. Uh, you know, the, what you get from the lunar time scale is a curve that relates to the bombardment flux. And we know that flux from the moon. And on Mars, we, we see a similar flux. And so relative to that flux, it's just what's happening is, is that as we get past what's called late heavy bombardment, we go into the history of Mars when, when you produce the clays, most abundantly, and then it seems like you go into the sulfates. And there's the, the, the borders, the Hesperian, Noachian, and Amazonian, that's not for the moon, that's just for Mars. Yeah? Are there any current technologies uprising or like advances that you really see playing a significant uh, role in future, future missions or projects? 
Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of them. You know, NASA has a, has a stable of horses that they fund, and they get to what are called technical readiness levels. And if one is ready for a mission, uh, a, a, somebody that wants to be a principal investigator can propose this to go onto that mission. And then they compete with everybody else, and they consider the mass, how much energy it uses, and so on and so forth. Turned out that the mass spectrometer used twice as much energy as it was supposed to do. So, uh, you know, things like that happen, but there's a big competition associated with that. Uh, the next rover has a bunch of instruments on there. One that I'm quite interested in is a, it's another laser, and it, will, it has two capabilities. One that works like our laser does now. It's called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. And the other one is, is a Raman, which, and in, with the Raman capability, you might actually be able to see organic compounds, and then the rover can go there and collect those rocks to bring back to Earth. Yeah, just in the back there. Great question. Uh, in terms of the petrology, all the rocks that we've seen, we've seen very few igneous rocks, but some of the conglomerates, where we see them is as clasts in the conglomerates, and some of the clasts are this big. And, and we, can see, we can see porphyritic textures. <clears throat> um, if we analyze those clasts, and we analyze the sandstones, and we analyze the mudstones, everything is alkaline. So it looks like gale actually hit a province of Mars uh, with more alkaline basalts than have ever been observed before on Mars. It looks more differentiated. There are a few class in the conglomerates uh, where we have some laser data only, unfortunately, that show uh, high silicon and high sodium and calcium. And we think that the rocks could be anorthosites. And, um, and, and now, now we're fine. So it looks like it's a more evolved crustal province. And then when we get into this lake bed with the silica, we see this detrital tritomite coming in. Cristobalite can be produced diagenetically, and all the amorphous silica could be produced authogenically. Uh, but the tritomite, we don't really think it's possible to get out of the constraint that that must come from a very high temperature rock. And on Earth, you know, felsic. Volcanics, of course, are where you get vapor phase deposition of, of, of tritomite. So we, we think that somewhere around the crater rim, there, we might be probing into an even more evolved crustal province where we actually had true felsic rocks uh, and magmas. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, it turns out that there's a good many of them, and uh, the, the mission has certain requirements, one of which is to return a rock, an igneous rock that can be dated. So you can find, like Gale would never work for that reason, because we've, we've never seen anything from orbit or on the ground that looks like a lava flow. But there are other, what look like crater basins, where there looks like what might have been a lava flow there, that would be a candidate because then the rover could sample that lava and bring back a rock for geochronology. Um, the, uh, there's a bunch of those, but there are also a, a good number of sites that sample the very ancient crust of Mars, where from orbit, you don't see obvious signs of layering. It looks like it's, it's very complex breaches, maybe impact breaches, where there might have been hydrothermal systems that are also candidates for habitability. So I think there's a lot of interest to go explore that because with this mission, I'm not sure I'd want to go back to another lake. I, I, I think that with, with one mission every 10 years, we should try to probe the end members of Mars and yet honor, also honor the agency's requirement that we as scientists do the best job we can to, to pursue this, the business of astrobiology. Yeah. What erosional process do you imagine that left that mountain? 
Oh, I am just reviewing a paper now. Actually, I'm not supposed to say that, but uh, um, it's a good case. They, they have a, a big experimental, a physical model and a numerical model that was, that was run at a, uh, an aeronautics uh, facility. And, and they, can, they can get evacuation of a Gale Lake uh, uh, basin just by having the wind blow from one direction uh, for a sustained period of time. The question is, what's a sustained period of time? But, you know, if it doesn't ever rain on Mars and you have hundreds of millions of years of time for the wind to blow, maybe you could evacuate. I don't see how you could do it with water because water is just going to keep filling it back up again. So I, I think it has to be aeolian, but it would be nice to prove it. I'm not sure we're going to be able to do that. Yeah. I think I'm recalling a National Geographic story properly that you've got the rover stuck. Is that, is, that, is that part of the decision you talked about going to an automated process as opposed to somebody driving it into a, an area? Uh, it might have been probably the one that you read was about curiosity. And uh, there, it was nice to be able to tell the story about the wheel damage. That doesn't really, ha that doesn't feed forward. What, what that story is about is it turned out that at Gale, the wind is ripping there, and all of the hard rocks are, are eroded into pyramids. And when we drive across them, they were puncturing the wheels that were made out of aluminum. Now you might ask, why did you idiots make the wheels out of aluminum? What we could have done is made them a little bit thicker, but what happens is in the force balance of the sky crane and in, in the physics of that double pendulum problem, you want, you, want the, you want the sky crane, the descent stage, to always be the master and the rover to be the slave. You don't want the rover to start swinging around. The more massive it gets, the more likely it is to go on its own control pathway. And so the wheels were one of the easiest ways to reduce mass without compromising the science payload. So next time the wheels will be a little bit thicker. Yeah. I think we should take only one or two more. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, let's give John the thunder.